if I could share anything, if you want to pin this to the beginning of the podcast or something like the message, you are not stuck. You don't have to continue if you don't want to. I respect teachers that have been honest about how difficult things can be. The issue is that they often slip in the narrative that it's too late. You've started this deconstruction. The only way is through now. I am living proof, if you want to come talk to me, that I have found my brain to be neuroplastic and that the same way that I ended up having no self, I have gone back. And I, I'm not perfect. Like, I, I still feel like I'm a little bit more prone to being sensitive, maybe anxious or depressed. Yeah. Uh, there, there's some lasting stuff, but 95. And in some ways, over 100% back. If you build yourself back from nothing, there's a strong resilience to yourself that comes from that. Isn't that artwork from one of your albums? Actually, very relevant, I feel like, to the glorious both and discussions Thank around you. self. Yeah, the, the album is, and also the album art, there's, it's hard to see. Maybe, yeah, we can have it posted somewhere, but there's a really black super black background. And that for me was representing what selflessness was feeling and emptiness was feeling for me. It's just like dead and cold, uh, unlivable. But in the inside, there's like a flowering of, of like actual flower petals, but also the like gold plated pieces. It's like a three-dimensional collage hand put together thing. And that for me was like representative of the, the reconstruction that I had to do wow. back to being a person and creating meaning, starting from scratch, but also it was always there. It was just the access to those parts yeah. myself was obliterated. <laughs> yeah. I already feel that resonance and how deeply we've gone into the loss of self and the process of rebuilding or restructuring or rebirthing. Excited to dive into, first of all, like how you, how did you get there? Yeah. Like how did you get to meditation and what kind of meditation everything i guess it led you to losing your sense of self let's say in your yeah life. yeah i grew up in a christian household and i left that faith around 16 i was still in high school and anyone who's left the faith knows that it's like a really challenging thing so i was looking for okay what what is spirituality to me and that's when I started getting into meditation because it seemed on paper like so secular, just yeah. like no belief, purely like a health mindfulness kind of standpoint. And it was for a long time. Uh, I practiced in total for around 10 or 11 years. And the first five were great. I was evangelical about it. Like I, it, it consistently would bring me into a very calm nervous system state into deepening layers of like stillness, particularly around the breath. I was doing mostly like concentration practice during that time. And yeah, it was a very like reliable tool. I didn't recognize it then, but I was slowly getting rid of all my other tools because I had this one that was so potent. So I guess what I mean by that is, yeah, spending more time sitting and cultivating that versus exploring, creating art or making new friends or you know, doing... Yeah what a lot of people do at, the, at that age. I started it. Yeah. So then the first, oh, wow. yeah, until I was around probably about 20, I was doing the concentration practice. Can you say more about what that is? I guess what would be the general instruction for that? Yeah, it was sit and focus on the breath. I would either like in my belly, like the sensations of rising and falling in my belly, mm -hmm. or sometimes like the subtle sensations mm -hmm. of like air at my nostrils and then basic instruction of keep coming back to that um, with your attention and then there would be lengthening periods where that was the only thing in my experience for a while like no thoughts like less body sensation and then eventually I don't know how to describe it there was like a focus on a mm -hmm. I, yeah it's a bit hard to describe and that was all very pleasurable and like helpful and and nice. And then about halfway through my practice, I started reading Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha by Daniel Ingram and getting into Shenzhen Young's kind of Vipassana stuff. So that's when I took that concentration and started focusing more on the thoughts that were arising, noticing the impermanence of sensations, like the moment they appear and disappear. Mm -hmm. And then eventually started really honing in on the moments that 
thoughts end and the moments things. And that's, yeah, that's when I started having what I am now, like my framework of having adverse effects from that. Like it was un, it was cool at first, like the first time I looked in the mirror, was, oh, it feels like I'm looking at a picture of myself or something like I must be on the right path. But it got to a point where everything felt foreign. Every single part of my experience felt observed. And so, yeah, maybe, and I kept going because that was what any teacher would say is keep going. Right. This is the dark night of the soul. That was the framework I had. And I believe that, okay, well, I'm left as just the observer. If I can let go of that, then there'll be like some magic goodness to it all. But it got to a point where I, my health was so poor and having thoughts around suicide. And that's yeah. when I sought help because I was like, okay, I think this practice might actually kill me, like physically kill me. I don't think that's what I started all this for. And that was at that point I sought help from Cheetah House, which is an organization that does a lot of research on adverse effects. It's led by, and I learned I'm not alone. And at that point I learned that even if I, even if it's still true that I should have kept going or there was some truth there, I ultimately just don't care anymore. It was like costing me everything and it wasn't what I signed up for. So even though my personal belief is that was like at least partially an induced state, I'm not certain it was any truer than other experiences. My other opinion is even if that is the truth, I, I'm happy with being a self and having friends and meaning and all that. That's the, sh the shorter version. I hope I didn't That's ramble great. too much. <laughs> I, I like it because it leaves me a lot of room to ask questions. What you shared so far, I know I don't know all the details, but some of the trajectory feels familiar to me in that sense of like when I first discovered meditation and started with mindfulness and it was to help me, to help me loosen extremely ruminative mind like yeah. a lot of looping thoughts and more on i would say on a bit more of an extreme end of a spectrum of rumination and overactive mind and definitely felt a lot of times like i'm in like a mental prison but just that what you described is i think a lot of people have that misconception that if that it's either like you're harmed by meditation or you're held by it or if you get harmed by it it's because and you wrote this on your website which i or on the cheetah house, it says, you said, I hope to help change the dominant narrative that meditation's always safe for everyone. And if you're having issues, you're doing it wrong. So that whole idea that you just didn't, you just didn't do it right. And so you obviously don't even know what it's like for meditation to help you or be beneficial. Whereas I think what people are really understanding now is that like, you can be meditating for 50 years and it being only positive and liberating and transformative tool and then something can take a dark turn it can be a feature mm. and there's nuances to all of that but yes just to say like, i empathize with wow like meditation was a holy grail for me and in such a healthy way in the beginning it was like i never knew it was possible to have a quiet mind like mm -hmm. you can exist this way but not have the nut house chattering and learn so much about myself and really felt like it in so many ways, and I know it can be a really helpful tool, but it went from being that tool of having a greater choice over where you put your attention and more clarity of mind or peace of mind to then becoming something more hardcore, which I think is where it started, like where it veered off onto more of the extreme kind of, for me, I don't know if new Advaita means anything to you. I've um, heard the term. Yeah. And uh, more of the hardcore ego death path of like direct path to no self in Buddhism or self-realization in Advaita and Hinduism that's essentially the non-existence of self, but confusingly makes it into discovering the capital S self, which is your true self versus the little S self, which is your false sense of self that mm -hmm. has to be destroyed in order to be free and know the truth. Um, it, yeah. Sorry, I'm getting away from asking you questions, which is what I meant to do. No, um, I'm very happy to hear okay, your experiences cool. as well. It'll all come together. But my question was, because you mentioned that there was a point where you started reading Daniel Ingram and then Shinsen Young. And I think I know that Daniel Ingram talks about or has conversations with people about adverse effects of spiritual practice. But I also understood that he does teach an enlightenment model. I think he describes himself as somebody yeah. who has lost their sense of self or transcended it. 
was curious, like when you started reading those books, if did it take on a new intention for you? Did that bring in a new framework? And oh, this is also about something called like enlightenment or. Yes, that's yeah. when my framework started to shift and it caught fire, too, because I had noticed the flexibility within the sense of self just from experiencing some of those concentration states that is in a way like a loosening of that so I was, I was yeah it's oh okay i see how this could be the path for me right. because i've already experienced some of it like a natural uh, progression <laughs> the big gun <laughs> yeah yeah i was like all right i'm getting to the, the meat of it which yeah which i think my personality is prone to just having wanting to do everything like one the best yeah so that's when the framework yeah. switched for me and it became goal and future oriented of having a fundamental and permanent shift and yeah my experience yeah yeah that's an important part i think is like like the, i always try to put in like the word permanent because people seek out with like psychedelics and various experiences to have glimpses or like an ego drop or like ego death experience to then come back into their world and you know back to themselves and maybe see things in a new way yeah it's very different when you're following a path on permanent eradication of the cell yeah dissolution of self but th this is something permanent right um, okay so it took a turn towards okay there's a different goal here now that's beyond just clear mind and that sort of thing um, like calm and yeah calm yeah. and being or maybe a better like a better experience or uh, I, I heard a lot in my path of the hardcore core non-dual stuff was always like this isn't about having better health it's not about having better relationships or being a better person or a father mm -hmm. or a partner or anything it's about not being a person yes okay so we got to a certain the same point where that was the framework now it was losing the sense of self liberating yourself from self exactly and, and then also then that notion of ultimate truth was that oh yeah was that introduced only then or was that also in the concentration a bit i think i had been swimming around the ideas for a while i, I think i was into ajahn chah before that mm -hmm. he was a monk in australia i remember reading a book on the fruition of like concentration practice if you follow that all the way then there's eventually like a disappearance that that mm -hmm. happens in experience so I, yeah it wasn't like the first i'd heard of it but that was the first time i think i committed to vipassana like looking for impermanence and emptiness in my experience that was like daniel ingram thing and then shenzhen young i learned a lot of compartmentalizing your experience into the senses yeah and so i had i like systematically reduced my experience so that everything was in the space of being observed and yeah whether it was an external thing like sounds obviously but then there's internal sounds like thoughts and they would arise as though like it was someone mowing their lawn. There was no difference in that experience. Yeah. Yeah. That kind of shift into being the observer and not the observed or the mm -hmm. witness or the, I know that that probably was lots of different language used around it, but I do feel like a core part of it is decoupling awareness from the objects of awareness. Yeah. Then when it becomes bringing in the identity or meta metaphysics, then it's what you really are is what's aware or what you really are is the awareness and not what's within it. So yeah. I'm just recognizing that kind of shift as well. That was pretty, pretty radical. Also pretty fundamental to a secular like mindfulness or meditation practices. Agreed. It's bringing in like the binary of there is a truth and then a false way of living yeah. and being a self. And one of the frameworks we use at Cheetah House, which maybe I should mention for the podcast that I'm a, a peer supporter there. So I see a few people a week who are having these issues yeah. and just come in as a, a friend to a lot of people experiencing this just need to know they're not alone, not the only ones having it. And then also we have the body of research that shows that you didn't do it wrong. Yeah. That research study is mainly teachers and their students. Um, so these are the people. Yeah. These are people that have dedicated their life to it. Anyways, uh, one of the frameworks we use is the idea of like a, like a bell curve. It's like a graph. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just a, a basic idea that there, there may be an optimal level of 
like distance or awareness of your thoughts or experience. For example, if there's no space with your thoughts and, you, and your thoughts are running around, you you might feel like, yeah, like distressed and, and there's like no freedom. You're just on, yeah. you're in that monkey mind thing. And then so you, you practice some awareness, some concentration practice, and maybe there's like this peak where you're experiencing enough separation to where you can have like some insight and some space, some yeah. flexibility on what's you. That's but a- for me, I went way past optimal to the point that I would wake up and there, the thought to get up would, would just be a faint whisper and then it would fall. And then I wouldn't get up because I was so distant it's from thing here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's just a framework. And I think I've, having been burned by two religions now, I'm very careful, yeah. like about new ideologies and stuff. So I, I try to sure. preface everything with this is what has worked for me or this is my yeah framework yeah and I did it as well now it's I'm not offering another ultimate truth no yeah I don't know you, but a no perspective I like that you said that because that balance is like what I realized too when I realized what an extreme path I had been on and just that either or binary that makes so much of this imbalanced and like you said it's like it's finding a sweet spot and the teachings that I was following were not emphasizing that it was all spaciousness, all boundlessness, like the more more infinite, the better. I don't know if you can have more infinite. I don't know. But Mm. like that, like the loss of containment, no, the swinging to the opposite extreme, right? It's you're too bounded. So now let's become unbounded. No. Okay. Expand our boundaries, but lose your containment. That's gonna, that's gonna lead to some big difficulties in functioning and health and well-being if you're living in society and not in a monastery or Absolutely. Yeah. There's a huge cultural piece, I think. Yeah. With this I know, kind of hitting I'm the web. For 20 hours because it's just, we've explored and learned so many of the same things and all of it's important, right? It's all really important for people mm-hmm. to understand. But I'm really glad that you mentioned Cheetah House. I was going to get there at some point. But first of all, Cheetah House, like I, I want more and more people to be aware of Cheetah House because it's freaking awesome. I just like the website says uh, it's like uh, support for meditators in distress. What you're doing, people really should know about, because I think part of the audience that we're speaking to are people who we do want to know, want them to know that they're not alone. And I imagine that it's pretty, a pretty high number of people that contact the Cheetah House in distress. Yes. Yeah. It's a lot. And we, being a small nonprofit, we've, and being a peer support organization means that we have, a lot of us have lived experience. So we've had to learn to have a lot of boundaries because the demand is more than we can fulfill. We do one-on-one consults and we do a support group and then we'll do some workshops and things on like rebuilding yourself. I am so lucky in that I found help and that I've been given a chance to turn all that difficulty into, it's a silver lining that I can help people. Like I'm someone that kind of hates silver linings because I think it just whitewashes your love. You, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now that I'm past it, I'm like, yeah, I'll take everything I can get. But I don't think I would have wanted to go through that again. Yeah. Just to be able to meet people every single week, new people that have ended up here. These are smart, strong, talented, educated, awesome people yeah. who have ended up in extreme difficulty from these practices and such a wide range. And very commonly, no mental health history or any pre-diagnoses sometimes for sure and a lot of people coming from like the new apps and coming quick people that have had no meditation experience doing like the 28 day sam harris waking up thing so many people i meet every week who yep have had massive disorienting shifts in their sense yeah. of self who have had no exposure so it's yeah it's pretty wild it's Hello, yeah. this is a wake up call. We're seeing multiple people a week coming from your app. Wake, wake up, Sam. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wait, to wait. his credit, to his credit, he does have like references to us. And so I do respect that. I do see people every week coming from the modern applications on this stuff. Yeah. And it's really hard to see such a high volume and people who have no history and then dedicate just a month to it. Yeah. Ending up in such distress is, yeah, it's really rough. And yeah, so I think 
what you were just saying about how where actually a lot of people end up from these practices is very different from what we need in our culture of being an individual, being having your own desires and abilities to communicate them and have boundaries and yeah. a certain level of productive is necessary in the US. And it's difficult with these apps and the dissemination of ego death to the masses without proper disclaimer. I think it's wrecking havoc. And at Cheetah House and what in my own life, getting back in touch with my values, like why did I start this practice and yeah. where have I ended up is been so important to me because I personally started for very simple reasons. I just wanted a way to calm my nervous system and I wanted to feel more connected to my life and other people. <laughs> yeah. And then 10 years later, I, my nervous system is absolutely on the fritz, like yeah. cycling between panic, fear, and then a week of the most like deep nihilism or not, sorry, not anhedonia, anhedonia, like no feeling at all. And then being literally unable to connect to anyone. <laughs> so I personally, that's what I learned from Cheetah House was to reflect back. What were my values? Where'd I end up? Yeah. Where am I wanting to go? And just getting the message out that people have diverse reactions to these practices. But I am right. trying to, to at least represent the people that are doing these practices correctly and ending up right. very distressed. Yeah. It sounds like what we're, and I'm pretty sure Cheetah House too, is we're not saying that there's no benefits to it. No. We're in, we wouldn't have been involved with it for so long that it's really like the crux of it for me is a double-edged sword. Something that can help you immensely can also hurt you. Or there can be elements that help you and others that don't. Again, it's like the both and. Um, yes, which I love, and, yeah. So I think like the point, and I hope with conversations that I'm having, that it is about bringing the balance in. But from our perspective, because we've experienced it and we've put in God knows how long in trying to understand it and educate ourselves about it, not to deny the fact that there are benefits and immensely positive, profound experiences that you can have with these types of mm. practices. But people like us need and are offering an emphasis on what's missing in the conversation, which is the hidden, undisclosed adverse effects, how prevalent they are, how serious they are. Because there's so much access to the glorified, positive, glowing reviews of losing your sense of self, we've got enough access to that. But the price of underestimating the adverse is too high. And I think we, yeah. we know that now, especially when you work with people who research this stuff, that it's not on the fringe. It's not like even... I think with mindfulness, a lot more people don't experience really bad adverse effects than people that do. But when it gets more into ego mm -hmm. death and ego dissolution, I think it's par for the course. <laughs> like if you go down those yeah. paths in, in a hardcore way, you're going to hit some of this stuff. It was interesting what you said about like people who write about it and teach it that maybe they've had only positive experiences. I think one of the issues is inexperienced teachers or like prophets that have had this massive experience. They've had that big explosive experience and I'm free and there's no voice in my head anymore and everything's one and blissful detachment. But that can have an expiration date and you won't have yet hit those pitfalls. So I don't know for you, but some of the people that I learned from almost 15 years ago now, people that were immediately teaching and putting YouTube videos out there, writing books on the indescribable, liberating absence of all those words you can string together. Yeah. But that they now are coming out and saying how they hadn't oh, yet yeah. experienced pitfalls and, and that they were bypassing, that it had all these consequences. Like you said, now I can't relate to anyone or mm -hmm. I can't really fulfill being a dad anymore. I have no motivation. I'm hospitalized be aware that like when you do hear people only touting the benefits it could be that they don't know about the the adverse effect that they haven't had them there are people where it's something exploitative i don't think we need to go there right now but just yeah, that there's so many sure. different reasons why because this is a new thing in the west that yeah. we're only now really getting this explosion and research and and people talking about it 
I don't know if it's possible to do this, but to say, are there commonalities in terms of maybe a few of the main adverse effects people are having that you hear from? I'm curious for people who are listening, maybe like a few of the main things where other people might be like, yeah, that's how it affects more than me too. For sure. Yeah. And there is research from Cheetah House, the varieties of contemplative experiences. If anyone's listening and they want to dive into, like, I think there's seven domains and every there's yeah detailed notes on every experience people have had that has been self-described as, as adverse but what i see most commonly are shifts in like the framework i'm using is like shifts in the nervous system okay. so people that a lot of people missing sleep having issues with that and then also others who are really hypo aroused like really down low like they are speaking really slow and moving slow. And then people that are all over the map, like myself, <laughs> feeling both of that. So that's what I would describe as shifts in the nervous system. And then shifts in sense of self that are being self-reported as distressing, sometimes major. I, yeah, like I've, I've met with people who really feel like they, they are like a foot behind and like a yeah. foot to the right. Like they'll even be able to be like, I'm over mm -hmm. here. <laughs> Facial, like physicality, dissociation kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Dissociation is probably the simplest. Feeling like you're looking at a 2D image, like a flattening and you're so like changes in visual field. Yeah. It can feel like a bit cartoonier. And then there's also like a widening, like things can feel really, there's an intense depth or like things are Perception. far away. But yeah. The visual realm. And then there's what we're, terming energy-like somatic experiences, mm. which I think in the spiritual world is what most people just refer to as like energy in the body. That'd be like Kundalini type? Yeah, yeah, I think so. So I meet with a lot of people who are like, I have this feeling in between my eyes that is like so strong and yeah. won't move. And I had that for a while. But different locations and, and commonly like where people have been putting a lot of attention, there can be mm -hmm. those experiences. And issues with memory and just functioning and issues connecting like life feeling meaningful or anything being interesting. Yeah, those are definitely a lot of the ones. I, since I did this talk on Buddha at the Gas Pump a year ago to talk about my experience with mm. modern non-duality and on the dangers of it. And so it's been a year. I think mm. I've gotten close to 100 emails now from people. Yeah. The main things, it's usually it's extreme nihilism, like complete loss of motivation and apathy, profound isolation and alienation because of that lack of a sense of, we're talking very extreme here because it's nobody's real. They're all just like walking fictions. And right. I know that I'm nothing and I'm nobody and everybody else is like a deluded zombie. And the memory loss, I wanted to go back to that. It sounds like Cheetah House has uncovered that as a side effect potentially mm -hmm. of types of meditation but yeah it's like in the oh. cognitive domain so okay. if, if anyone is digging into that research paper there's that's one of the domains cognitive and domain. memory is just okay. one of those changes yeah. that can happen cognitively I'm gonna, I'm gonna put that in the description i've got a For whole sure. list of the <laughs> website what i was gonna say with something that i've been really following is i've been hunting for anybody who's doing any research and in investigation into the adverse effects of hardcore pursuit of loss of self. Let's say losing your sense of self through contemporary self-negating non-dual teachings. That's my mouthful for it. But so there's a woman, this amazing woman who's, who experienced loss of sense of self. And she describes it as, and sometimes she refers to it as persistent self-transcendence or persistent loss of self. I don't know if you came across the term abiding awakening. And there seems to be a really big misconception that challenges that you're having with the growing pains of stabilizing and awakening are then ameliorated once it's abiding. So you just got to mm -hmm. get what she's saying is that she experienced this and she said there's a lot of ways that she's benefited. And I don't think that she regrets it in any way, but she also recognized that she ex has experienced a reduction in feelings of empathy, that she's also noticing short-term memory gaps. So she interviewed like a bunch of people who self-report having lost their sense of self through non-dual teachings or awakenings and found that a 
significant percentage of them. And again, we're talking about people who have an abiding loss of health, experience like dissociation, relational issues, like relational impairments, and then memory loss and reduction in empathy. And so what she's trying to say is that actually side effects could be longer lasting the more lasting your loss of self is or Mm -hmm. the longer that you're practicing. So there's, again, like that notion, you were talking about it earlier. I just know that one of the big misconceptions that I hope that people like us can clear a bit is that advanced practitioners or people who like really get it or have this experience or stabilize it, whatever you're going to call it, enlightenment or loss Mm -hmm. of self or other words we use for these Mm -hmm. arrived states of being that I've lost my train of thought again. That'll happen. (laughs) It was a good train though. Just some of the things that I'm really focused on is how to empower more people to speak up and Yes. What a lot of the research is showing that Cheetah House is part of that to me is just it's so valuable and so important. It's showing that a lot of people who experience adverse effects did not have prior significant psychological issues or trauma, were uh, yeah. stable, uh, healthy, developed egos. But to really clarify that, because A, if that misconception persists, then people who have been harmed are le- less likely to talk about it because. Yes. You feel ashamed or dismissed, but then also people don't have clarity around the fact that, yes, you are susceptible to risk, no matter how stable or healthy you are going into it. Um, Absolutely. I think that's a little bit of a hard pill to swallow, but one that we have to. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, Very well said. And I'm on board with all of that. And I appreciate what you're doing to reach all the audiences, people that are having great experiences with it, people that are having mixed and people that are having harmful experiences like the glorious both and I really respect that the way you're handling that. I came out with a lot of anger, especially around yeah, without naming names, like I know retreat centers that have signed NDAs with people over like lawsuits and they know what's going on. But the issue is a pristineness to the practice. And nice. This yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Again, it's just my opinion. I'll be honest, my opinion. And it's scary to come here and say this. There are teachers that I've looked up to for so long and now I'm coming out against what they're saying. And I'm worried. That's scary. Like those people carry significant weight in my life. So I'd be nervous for them to yeah. hear this or backlash. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people I work with have dealt with that directly mm-hmm. backlash. So, yeah, my opinion is that. People are having diverse experiences and we're doing research about it. And like you said, I expect there'll be a trend between the more advanced your practice, the greater severity. Mm-hmm. Anecdotally, I've seen every type of response to these practices. Yeah. People that dabbled and got very severely distressed. And then people that have had just mild distress that they worked out. And exactly. so it's yeah. not saying that everyone who experiences this has to give it up. I had to, and I wanted to, but the issue for me is the pristineness and the religionness of it. What that creates is anyone who's having a different experience gets shoved aside, basically told they they did it wrong. They need to do it more. Yeah. Yeah. And that basically that their experience isn't valid. That's the issue. And and it's so sad because I, when I I remain hopeful, I really (laughs) hope for a world where we can all work together and provide the best care and experience for people that are wanting to pursue this. And I think that just requires a little bit of flexibility on anyone that's putting an ideology forward, myself included. It's, yeah, I've met people that are still on the train and going for that truth. And and I just, I'm not going to impose my thing. I can just talk a bit about my recovery and I'd be happy just to put my narrative out if it, if it, lines up with anyone's yeah just chronologically the things that were important for me in my recovery first was to know that I wasn't alone and joining a support group of people that have been through it have you can only talk so much to people who haven't had these experiences look at you weird so to really talk to people who've been there that started to give me some space around the ideology of it gave me a safe place to be 
to see other people being flexible with their ideologies gave me some space. And then, yes, a, a change in worldview is how I view it. That was critical. Mm -hmm. And for me, it came at my wits end, like it was a forced kind of reevaluation of whether this practice was matching my values because it, yeah, it was destroying me. And so I chose to loosen my grip on what is truth because it was necessary. I, I would have loved to do, have done it earlier. <laughs> and we, we have done a survey just among people that have come through Cheetah House and we were surprised to see that at the top of the list of what was helpful was a change in ideology or framework for their experience. Yeah. Among this, a lot of other things we, I'll talk about more. So to be specific to me, I shifted from the Vipassana path of stages of insight and being in the dark night of the soul with no chance of returning. I shifted that perspective to nervous system dysregulation brought on by intensive right. practices. That's just my switch. People have had many, some people stay with a spiritual switch or like a spiritual framework, but that released the guilt of that I had done something wrong. And then wow. learning a bit about neuroplasticity and neuroscience gave me yeah. hope of, oh, maybe this is an induced experience. And in the same way that I induced it, I can induce other experiences through practice. Then, and still, the, I was still like in hell during that. Like it wasn't an immediate it took me like a year and a half until I crossed like the 50% threshold where half of my days I felt like myself. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember that shift. I'm like, oh my God, the, like more than half of my day, I like actually enjoyed and was worth living. And I felt myself like big moment. So yeah. And then I started to learn more specific skills around reconstructing the self. And Cheetah House is a, its origins are meditators in distress trying to figure out what the hell what do we do what's everyone trying so there's been this practice that has been constructed that's borrowing a lot from somatic experiencing there's practice called resourcing which is where you're directing your attention towards an object or activity that is nourishing for you and it, it, you can build safety through that relationship the thing with somatic experiencing is they commonly go to the body really quick. And yeah. for meditators, that's either offline or it's like through the roof, like there's too much going on. Mm -hmm. So we, yeah, we've adapted that a bit to, we're now calling it scaffolding. It, it's also borrowing from Joel Kruger's work on the scaffold itself. And yes, yeah, so that was what really started to, I started to gain traction back towards like a regulated nervous system and feeling myself. And then now that's what I do a lot in peer support with people. Yeah. And so it's in, in simple terms, it's an opposite practice to Vipassana in which you're constantly stripping away associations. Yes. It's like I'm not talking with you. I'm actually looking at pixels on a screen that are just color. Yeah. But it's yeah. Strip, stripping away. broken down into part. Exactly. And so this practice you're, still using the concentration that you've developed so not all is lost and you're actually building associations and then there's an autonomy piece you are mm -hmm. choosing which road you're going down so it's not like you're opening yourself up to everything you're choosing what is nourishing or good for you in that moment and so instead of you just being pixels on a screen you're jessica someone who reached out to me who we both have these experiences in life and we both make music about it and right. we're in different parts of the world connecting and I can already feel now there's like a warmth coming up in my chest so it's okay then we would bring in that sensation and you're bringing so you're bringing more and more together instead of separating it's like coming together the opposite of dissolution yeah you know there's those AI like art generators Yes. Yeah. I keep trying to give it a prompt that will show me like there's so many images of like ego death and dissolution and meditators work like the particles are spreading out. I want one that like shows all of that coming back together. Coming and together. That's yeah. More. Of, that's what this part of the process has been. But yeah, it sounds like you have a lot of valuable like frameworks and resources. So what would be like for anybody who's listening who would want to connect with Cheetah House or you? I don't know. Do they connect with you directly or submit through mm -hmm. Cheetah House? Sure. Yeah, definitely check out our, starting with our website, I think is the easiest. It's just, what is it? Cheetahhouse.org. 
and you can find like a lot of resources and, and the research there. Um, and then you can book consultations. I'm available. I have openings. There's others on the care team. And then you can also meet with Willoughby Britain, who is a really special mix of, you know, having done research on this stuff for years. And so, yeah, you can meet one-on-one. -on -one. We, we run a support group after we meet one-on-one -on -one if, if we think like it would be a helpful space. I was wondering, because you said like, we're talking about this process of rebuilding yourself or rediscovering yourself. Was there any, has there been anything for you of having to, I know for me and a lot of people that I'm connected with, it's, there really was like a extreme loss of a person that you thought you were. And so now it's to rebuild or come back to a self that's, there isn't one anymore, or there isn't one that feels like me anymore. So I wonder if there was any kind of like creation of, I don't know, maybe not a word that you relate to, but is there any element of like self authoring, like a new self or like elements of, I, I don't know if, if that's making sense at all. No, it, it does make sense. Like it's always going back, reverting necessarily to, oh, I don't want to go back before all of these things that expanded my awareness. And, but I wonder for you, if, if you discovered like that you had grown in different ways, like personally throughout that experience and were, sorry, I'm going to stop and let you go from there. <laughs> no, I could, no, it's a joy to, to connect with someone who understands this stuff. Yeah, I've, in my own life and then in, in experiences I've had with others, both has been important, like remembering what, you used to find enjoyable beforehand or even as a kid, uh, it can be a good place to start. I had a lot of threads that somehow survived. I've seen both be important, both to myself and others, reconnecting to what was, what parts of you enjoyed before all of it, if you can. There mm -hmm. can be continued threads, like music was one for me, but there is a lot of creation of self as well. Um, and I think people might be surprised how much of the, their selves are still intact. Yeah. Um, I describe it as like you're in this really dark tunnel and you can't see that around the corner is the light and you just don't believe it. Like yeah. there's no way that there's pieces of myself still around, but there are and you can create new ones. And the path for that for me has been through preference and starting really simple, really subtle, because mm -hmm. it, it was hard for me coming back to being a person like big decisions and big things would just I couldn't handle it, but deciding between two colors, which one I liked more, that was like a level where I could start finding preference it. again. I'm just like, sure. you know what? Yeah, very small, starting small uh, and with preference and then uh, and asking like, what, what does my organism need? Sometimes that's a question that helps people get the ball rolling on that. What sounds good right now? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just a blanket or it's to go for a walk. And yeah, and then over time through experimentation, before you know it, you've filled your life with these resources again, where without mm -hmm. thinking about it, you go on a morning walk, you love making your coffee and this song, and then you're going to do this with your friends. And, and just for starters, like it, it does seem to be very individual, which is what I would recommend is like, explore for yourself. If anyone wants to hear mine, like walking was super reliable, like long walks. And then writing has been helpful music that came a bit later after i had that's a bigger thing so that was a later one but a lot of really simple things like the feeling of a blanket or making yourself a nice tea that's in one of your songs i think it was like i have a kid or yeah that's exactly what i'm it's exactly what that line's about is i bought a sweater and i felt so wrong yeah i'm not supposed to gain joy right. or meaning from that right buy a sweater yeah, but I, there was something I liked about that one more than the others. And even though that sounds subtle, that is, that's self, like you're starting to get traction on self there through that small decision. And I hope to be a, a story of like, it's possible and that, and you can, it, it can gain steam in the same way that meditation gains steam and can drive you to some pretty wild experiences. Like it may seem like starting small and trivial, like what's your favorite color that you can see or a real simple one is when you walk into a room like what's my favorite thing hmm. in this room i like that. um not to go on a whole other rant but there's okay. like 
a lot of times in meditation, we're asked to place our attention where there's pain or tension with the idea that, you know, you would release it and move through it, which often works. But for me, I essentially train my brain to constantly seek pain uh, and discomfort. So for me, rebuilding that intentional skill of, of also seeing what is good, what feels good in my body, what do I like in the room helps. Like I had to do that exclusively for a few months just to reach neutral. And there was a lot of guilt around that, but it helped me to know Can that. Can you more about the guilt, if you don't mind? Yeah, for sure. And what, what from those practices or ideologies maybe led to a feeling of guilt around that? Yeah, I think the guilt of being a person and having preference and choosing to do something that would be enjoyable or pleasurable in some way is, I felt guilt because that is the opposite of what I had been taught and done for years, which was to notice that you have a desire, but recognize that there's no value in that and to let it go immediately. So yeah, if anyone's dealing with the guilty bit, I would That's a big rec one. recommend watching other people in your lives and notice people that maybe aren't, haven't been exposed to this and just see how many things they do in a day that for you would be guilty, but for them are no brainers. Like, of course, they're going to play their favorite song on the way to work. They're not like feeling guilty about that. So it, there can be like a more of a sense of, like, oh, I'm a normal person with normal needs. I don't need to feel guilty about that. Yeah, that's, it's really helpful to hear. And I think even just for other people to know that other people feel that because it's like, people that I speak to so common is like that feeling of guilt and shame. So it's yeah. like that constantly like gaslighting of that's just your ego that doesn't want to be with what is or mm -hmm. that just really that stopping you in, in your track. So it's it's nice to like to hear you say like, it's very small baby steps. Like it's it will come back, but it takes time and yeah, it's not going to be overnight and that's OK. For sure it is. And not, not all is lost and that the awareness you've built of your thoughts and feelings is going to be really helpful if what you're wanting is to engage with life. You're not, yeah, you have a lot of clarity on what these thoughts are. So you'll see, oh, I want to go kayaking. And you can choose in that moment, like, that would be nice. I'm going to do that. So yeah, there's a piece of hope there that like not all is lost. It's just your intention is switching from awareness of everything to maybe what I'm being aware of is coming with value. It actually means something and is me. And that if I follow that, I will feel more myself. Yeah. 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 To give it, I feel like a lot of it's like giving yourself permission, yeah. but I'm not allowed to do that or to do that or to think that because that's not spiritual or that will lead to suffering. When you were talking about making choices and not being difficult and having preferences that have to do with choiceless awareness type of practices or absolutely those exactly yeah yeah and, and I meant to mention that earlier I did end up doing a lot of the Dzogchen sort of practices oh. along with the Vipassana okay. I, I, I had forgotten to mention that yeah and both were but even the Vipassana too because they're the emptiness of the thoughts that were arising around preference yeah made them just made them pass without leading to an action. I and see. Yeah, I remember I needed to buy cutlery, like the silverware for a house. I went with a friend and we were standing there at the store. There's all these little boxes of silverware. This was fresh. Like I was acutely in distress during this. And I was having like a full sense of panic and dissociation yeah. around the fact that I, I could not pick. I couldn't like I... It just, I w no me was there to reference like what, which of these I would pick and to see someone else, my friend being like, these are cool because of this. And like, this, what about this, this is yeah. so quick for them. But the story ended up being a win for me because there was like this faint little thing that was like, oh, I like these like <laughs> you know? and, and it was so it small. Work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I decided, yeah, in that moment, I'm like, I like these. And I think it was especially hard because there was someone there who I was worried about their opinion. 
what did they think was the best silverware? And I hadn't yet built like confidence in being a person yet. So yeah, like that again was like such a small decision, but I will remember that for the rest of my life as being one of the critical moments that I started moving back towards being a person because I followed the thought, but it was so small and it was like so quiet. And then I gained confidence for future ones. Wow. It's so, thank you for sharing all these like really personal accounts. Honestly, I haven't spoken to many people who have shared their silver linings and things that help them get back to a trustworthy sense of self. And Mm. also like the way that you share is so like warm and supportive. And I imagine that you're an invaluable resource to people that you help. Oh, and I really hope that we can talk again too. There was something I wanted to say about Shins and Young. I'm just going to email it to you. You can do it. That's fine. I, I, now I'm curious. All right. Wait, you want me to tell you now? If that's okay. Next, oh, now yeah, I'm sure, curious. Sure, sure. No, I actually, because you mentioned Shins and Young. We were talking about lack of awareness around the adverse effects and dark nights of the soul. And so I found, and I'm, of course, not in any way negating whatever amazing things he does, but I thought it was really fascinating. And I just think it's a really good example of blind spots and misconceptions. So let's see if I can find it. So somebody asked him, it's like a Q&A and it's posted on his website. And they asked about the dark night of the soul and being afraid that they would have a dark night of the soul. And what Shinzen Young said was, this phenomenon in the Buddhist tradition is sometimes referred to as falling into the pit of the void. It entails an authentic and irreversible insight into emptiness and no self. Instead of being empowering and fulfilling, it turns into the opposite, enlightenment's evil twin. But then he says, this is serious, but still manageable, wait, through intensive, perhaps daily guidance under a competent teacher. In some cases, it takes months or even years to fully metabolize. But in my experience, the results are almost always highly positive. Mm -hmm. So just what I would like, what I'm pulling out from that is that A, a misunderstanding that it's uncommon because we recognize this is not uncommon. It's very common. And B, that he's what he's saying would be helpful for it is a support system that is not in place and is not being offered by these teachers, right? If you have it, you could be helped by constant monitoring by experienced gurus. I think it's a helpful sort of caution. It's a blind spot, but it's also showing us that these are things to be taken seriously. Absolutely. I've read exactly what you read yeah. so many, so many times. Yeah, that was like a guiding narrative for me when I was in that. And he has some videos online of like guiding people through Dark Night of the Soul and stuff. And that was one of the narratives that almost ended me and almost ended you just like the narrative that like that you oh, that if you keep going, that you'll that I have to that I literally no. have to be more specific feeling that level of distress and then being told that I'm basically stuck and could maybe get through after years of living at retreat, which is not an option for me. That pushed me towards suicidality because what's the point? Yeah. Very, very frustrating to hear that. And you're like, here comes some of my anger, which is uh, there. It's definitely. (laughs) Yeah. Rational. No, it's just awful convenient. It's awful convenient to tell someone that you're stuck and now you need to come on retreat. I respect teachers that have been honest about how difficult things can be. The issue is that they often slip in the narrative that it's too late. You've started this deconstruction. The only way is through now. If I could share anything, if you want to pin this to the beginning of the podcast or something like the message, you're not stuck. You don't have to continue through this if you don't want to. But I do think it's, it's a good something to point out to show one of the big safeguards that's missing when we teach this stuff in the West through YouTube and it's through a book or it's yeah. a one day workshop where you don't have access to the teacher anymore. Whereas in the past you were like in a communal setting, learning directly with a guru who understood what could go wrong, was there to support you daily around the clock as he's describing. But like how different it is now we're completely on our own and so True. i think the more people think about that context difference and how it removes like this massive safeguard of that direct access to somebody to right. community support structure that 
we lose that when we take out the religious tradition aspect, but we have to look at what safeguards we lose when we do that. Absolutely. And then yeah. realizing that people are ending up here who didn't have any intention of reaching yeah. this state. So telling them now that they're stuck is like, I can understand if that was like, all right, I grew up in that culture and that's, I decided that's absolutely what I want. Yeah. Then I wouldn't be that offended to hear that. I'd be like, great, I'm glad you can help me. Let's work this out. Right. But I didn't want to be here in the first place. And which is, you know, tell me that this could happen or. Yeah. I think that would be a good thing to talk about another time, maybe. That's like what I'm most passionate about. And okay, great. Yeah. I would and talk about that. Because we're almost there, like with, with Daniel Ingram, like a lot of respect to him because he's been very vocal about how crazy your experience can be. But the piece that that I want to change is this forcing your truth onto other people that have ended up here and then read this and they're like, oh, I'm past the point of no return. Yep. So I don't know. I haven't been yeah. into that in seven yeah. years, but yeah. <laughs> it's good that it's just interesting to see. And even like people like Sam Harris, like they'll be like, okay, yeah, there are things that can happen, but then they don't take proactive measures like to not teach it on YouTube to everyone and to not have disclaimers, not have assessments, right. not have consent, whatever, you know? So let's, okay. I think we're close. Most passionate about that topic because I think we could make some, say some powerful stuff about that. I love to. And uh, I think things are changing, which is great. Yeah. And I'm very hopeful. I'm hopeful for all of it. Yeah. I had some great experience with meditation and I think just making it a safer space would be great. And then also I'd love to talk about art because I know you do art yeah. as well and like the the clash between no self practices and art in my experience. I would love to talk about that. I don't. Would you be able to give me a quick preview? Yeah. Me? Yeah. Just that a lot of the cognitive changes I had from practice, like issues with memory would and also just issues creating associations between things oh, made yeah. it extremely hard to write music. Yeah. And now that I have done a lot of reconstructing, building associations, bringing together music comes and art comes really a lot more easily because I can just sit down at my guitar and play a chord. And instead of that just being like a collection of sounds that fades, I notice that, oh, that makes me feel I'm having an F, I'm having emotion. Yeah. And then that emotion reminds me of day. And now I'm having a vision of like where I was and who I was with. And that reminds me of the person, blah, blah, blah. So like the associations yeah. get going and then I can write a song with the C just being like a single chord. Whereas before I would play the chord and it was just it drop. Some people come off retreat and they come up to a, a stoplight and they don't associate red with stop. Exactly. So is that like a good no. sense of loss of self? What, like, Lama Maharshi didn't have to drive a car. <laughs> yeah. And again, some of the teachers I have idolized, but I've heard personal stories of people that have met these people. A lot of them will pay for servants to basically manage their lives. I'm like, why is that not in your book? <laughs> this is a, another thing maybe that can go into one of these topics is that you are saying that a lot of times the teachers, they will disclose things that can go wrong or went wrong for them, but very inconsistently like all of a sudden like after you followed them off the edge of yourself they're like yeah there was that one time after my awakening in the middle of traffic and didn't know what to do and almost got hit by a car or or mm -hmm. i was severely suicidally depressed and dysfunctional for six months mm -hmm. <laughs> huh interesting yeah. that, or like hallucinated like and doesn't you don't care if that happens to us <laughs> very nice of you yeah things to look for in a teacher that's that they disclose things in the beginning they disclose consistently and without judging and pressuring of it's usually how it's done is like a test of how much of a warrior you are but that's right. how the negatives are expressed by a lot of teachers true that yeah like, you'll have to jump in the fire now but the rewards are beyond your wildest dream right like, so when i'm looking for a teacher or anyone that i'm going to put up above me in terms of like, I have something to learn from them or whatever that the main thing I'm looking for is that they're curious about my needs and values like that they're actually asking if what I'm looking for is something they can help with and 
Right? And I think that very quickly leads into how flexible they are and what is truth. If someone yeah. is willing to say, this is what I do and this has been helpful versus someone's coming in, doesn't even ask what I'm looking for and then proceeds to tell me what the truth is. Yeah. No, thanks. And then looking for like, like empathy and compassion, but honestly, like a slight indifference as to what I choose to do. If you have doubts, hesitations, or don't agree or don't decide to follow that path that it, you're not looked down on, but so those are really good. We can maybe talk about those more another time, but I've kept you too long. Thank you so much. This look was an important conversation. Oh yeah. I look for, I, if you're open to it, I feel like this could be a, a long friendship thing. I would love it. Okay, sweet. Bye-bye. Okay. Wow. Right,